praise God. Well, we declare this 2016 our year of miracles. Amen. 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 Say, this is, this is my, year. my year. This is, is Bethel's year, year of miracles. Amen. 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 Say, I refuse to be at the right place and right time for a miracle and miss my miracle. Say, I refuse to be at the right place and the right time for a miracle and miss my miracle. Amen? That's not going to happen. In, in, in Mark chapter 5, uh, the story is told of Jesus having a meeting with Jairus. Jairus was a rich ruler of the synagogue, had a daughter who was extremely sick, nigh unto death. And Jairus came to Jesus, asking him to please come to his house and heal his daughter. And the scripture tells us Jesus immediately began to make his way to Jairus' house. But while on his way, a woman with an issue of blood came through the crowd and said, if I but touch the hem of his garment, I will be made whole. And she touched his garment, and she was instantly and totally healed. Thank God. Jesus is still in the miracle working business. Amen. You know, some people want us to believe that miracles stop happening with the death of the apostles. For some reason, they say, well, miracles happen in the Bible, and, but it only happened until or through the apostles. And when the last apostle died, who was John, God must have taken up a sign and said, you know, going out of business, you know, a shop closed, and stop working miracles, just as if people don't still need miracles. The reason God worked miracles then was people needed miracles. And the reason God is still in the miracle working business is because people still need miracles. Is there anybody here this morning who could use a miracle? Uh, just a few of you. Is there anybody here who could use a miracle? Amen. Say hallelujah. Well, as long as we need miracles, God intends to keep working miracles. Hallelujah. Christianity is a supernatural faith. And by that I mean it is based on the supernatural. It is based on the miraculous. If you take miracles out of Christianity, Christianity ceases to be. Jesus entered the world via a miracle, the virgin birth. Jesus exited the world via a miracle, the resurrection and the ascension. And the Bible says in between his birth and his ascension, he went about doing good, healing all, healing all, not some, healing all who were oppressed by the devil. So many miracles he wrote that it is said that there, there were not enough books in the world at that time to contain all the miracles that Jesus did. And so using that, we're saying to you, listen, God does not intend for miracles to be rare and occasional only once in a while. Amen? Judging from Jesus' ministry, which reveals the Father's life and heart and mind, God wants to work miracles not once in a while, but often. And so we have been led to declare this the year of miracles for us, and we need to be expecting God to work all kinds of miracles for us, in us, and through us. Amen? Not just for us, but in us and through us. Amen? Now, it's good to be so blessed that you don't need miracles, personally. Jesus never needed a miracle of healing because he was always healthy. So, so the preferred position is to be so blessed, you don't need a miracle. You can be a channel of miracles to others, but to, be, to walk in divine health so that you never need a miracle of healing. That's better. Don't you think so? Yeah, I would rather walk in divine health and never need a miracle of healing. So it's, it's better to be so blessed you don't need a miracle. Amen. It's better to be so blessed in terms of your finances, you don't need a miracle to pay your rent. You don't need a miracle to, to pay the mortgage. You, you, God has blessed you and you're walking in the, the provision of God at such a level 
that you don't need miracles for those kinds of things. You still can pray and believe God for miracles, but it's more so you can be in a position because you want to give. So that when there's an opportunity in the kingdom, you have more than your own needs being met, and you have an abundance to be able to give to support God's work or to do whatever God is leading you to do. That is the preferred position, but the fact is, all of us at some point will need miracles of different types. It is good to know that when you need a miracle, you can have one. It's good to know that when you need a miracle, just because you need a miracle, you qualify for one. The Bible says Jesus went about healing all who were oppressed of the devil. He healed all who were oppressed. So it seems to me the only requirement for a miracle was that you were oppressed by the devil. You didn't hear me. The only requirement for a miracle was that you needed one. Jesus did not ask you for your resume to see all the things you had done for God and all the things that you had accomplished to see whether you qualify or have been good enough for your miracle. I told you on, on Thursday night, Jesus is not Santa Claus, where you got to behave all through the year, supposedly to qualify for a gift for Christmas. The only qualification you need for a miracle is that you need one. So, how many of you need a miracle? Well, if you need one, then you qualify for one. Jesus came to the world in order to work miracles for people who need miracles. If you were not here on, on Wednesday, Thursday night, get the CD of that message. If you weren't here, get the CD because you need to hear that over and over again. Say, I'm qualified for a miracle because I need miracles. Amen? So let's establish it up front in this year of miracles that God wants to work miracles. God is willing to work miracles in your life. God is able to work miracles for you and through you. But if you want to experience all the miracles that God has, then you do need to cooperate. You don't, you don't need to qualify, but you need to cooperate with him in order to take possession of the miracles you already qualify for. You didn't hear me. I said, you and I do need to cooperate with God, not to qualify, but to take possession of the miracles we already qualify for. Amen? If somebody said, listen, we got a, 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 a grant that is already approved with your name on it for $10,000, but in order to pick it up, take this, this form, fill out the form, and mail it back. Correct? Now, when you fill out the form, you're not qualifying for the $10,000. You already qualified. It's already given to you, but you are cooperating with the person who wants to give you the $10,000 by filling the form out and sending it. You understand? So you don't have to do anything to qualify for miracles, but you do need to cooperate with God to take possession of that which you already qualify for. Amen. Are you listening to me? Yes. Say hallelujah. How do you qualify for a miracle? Simply need one. Simply need one. Amen? And then begin to cooperate with him. And this is where your faith comes in. Faith is important in order to take possession of what you already qualify for. Because miracles of God, which are free, work in conjunction with our faith in order to receive them. Okay? So in this year of miracles, we need to be prepared to use the faith God has given us so we can take possession of the miracles God has provided for us in Christ Jesus. Now, there are many people who think that miracles are totally up to God. That when you receive a miracle, it's just a pure act of God's sovereignty. And those who receive miracles are quote-unquote fortunate that they received a miracle because God just chose to give them a miracle. Now, I agree, there are some miracles that at least appear to be purely an act of God's sovereignty. By that I mean we cannot determine anything in the circumstances to suggest that the person who received the miracle did anything other than just simply being there, and God chose to do something. Now, it appears that way. There may be some facts we don't know about, but it appears that it's just purely an act of sovereignty. There are times when you come to a meeting and people get healed, and some of them are just there, they're not even believing. Some of them come, you know, some skeptics at times get healed. All right? And so there are instances that appear to be purely the act of God's sovereignty. When God is doing something and, and it looks like the person who's receiving the miracle didn't participate or didn't cooperate with God in that process. 
For instance, there's, in John chapter 9, there's an episode where Jesus and his disciples are passing by, and they see a man that was born blind. And uh, the disciples ask Jesus, who sinned? The, the, the man who's blind, did he sin? And that's why he was born blind. Or did his parents sin? And for that reason, he was born blind. Now, the question is kind of uh, uh, troubling. I mean, not, maybe not troubling, kind of strange that they would suggest that the, the baby, the man, when he was still in the womb, before he was born, sinned, and that's why he was born blind. But that's the question they're asking, because in that day and time, they thought that anybody who's born with a handicap of any kind is because of sin, primarily the sin of their parents. And so it's because of something bad the parents did that God now is punishing the parents by having this child be born with some type of handicap. But when they ask the question, who sinned, Jesus said neither. In other words, this man is not blind because he sinned. He certainly didn't sin in his mother's womb, and for that reason, God caused him to be born blind. And neither is he born blind because his parents sinned. So he was, he was, he was blind, but it wasn't because of his sin or for his parents' sin. Then Jesus said, listen, in order that the works of God might be done, I must work the works of God while it is day. For the night comes when no man can work. And Jesus took action and healed the man and gave him back his sight. When you read the story, there's no indication that the man was praying for healing, asking for healing, expecting healing. He was just there, and the Bible says he were passing by, and it was the disciples that brought him to Jesus' attention. But he was healed, and it looked like purely the act of God, and there was nothing he, the man, did. But that's not the rule. That seems to be more the exception. That certainly is not God's best. What God wants and when you read the scriptures, what Jesus indicates and what the Bible teaches in the New Testament over and over again is that the vast majority of miracles that God worked in the Bible, that God will work in your life, will involve a definite act of faith on your part. May I repeat? The vast majority of miracles that we will experience in 2015 will involve a definite act of faith on our part. A definite act of faith to receive a miracle that, is, that God has brought into your life, or a definite act of faith to make a miracle happen that you need. I believe there are two kinds of ways and two types of miracles that we receive. And it takes faith in both cases, but, but the, the way we exercise the faith is a little bit different. Okay, there are some miracles that will happen, and God shows up with a miracle, and all you really need to do is release your faith to receive the miracle that has found you where you are. You need to release your faith to receive the miracle. But then there are instances when you will need a miracle. It's, 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 it's available, but it's, it's going to require that you make the miracle happen. In other words, that you're going to have to release your faith intentionally on purpose and direct your faith towards a particular promise and claim it and make that miracle happen. Don't go through 2016 passive with your faith and just say, well, this is the year of miracles, so I can... No, no. You need to be intentional. If God wants to work more miracles in your life this year, then you need to be intentional. Use your faith to make miracles happen. In the, in the story, the woman with the issue of blood, Jesus was passing by. There's no indication that Jesus was conscious of her presence. Jesus was on, her way to, on his way to the house of Jairus to heal his daughter. This woman was one of many in the crowd. But she said out of her mouth, if I would but touch the hem of his garment, I will be made whole. Jesus was going about her business, but she recognized that the presence of God was there, the power of God was there, the power to work a miracle to heal her was available, and she made a decision. She had had enough. She had been sick long enough. And today, she was not going to let her miracle pass her by. She wasn't just going to sit and hope and pray that Jesus would take notice of her and Jesus would heal her. She made a decision. She made her mind, I'm going to receive my miracle. When I touch the hem of his garment, I shall be made whole. She didn't ask Jesus' permission. She just made her mind, the miracle is here, the power is here, I'm going to lay hold of that power, and I'm going to be healed. Amen? And she used her faith intentionally and got a miracle. Are you listening to me? 
And that's the attitude we got to have in 2016. Miracles are going to be in the atmosphere. Miracles are going to be in the vicinity. Some miracles will stare you right in the face, and all you got to do is receive it. But some miracles will be passing you by in your vicinity, in your neighborhood. And you've got to be intentional in deciding, you know what? I need a miracle. Miracles are available to me. I'm going to grab hold of my miracle. Amen. Say to your neighbor, you need to use your faith to make miracles happen in your life. Hallelujah. Now, now, you, 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 you may be saying, well, Bishop, are you saying that we'll just make God do what we want? No, you cannot make God do anything that God doesn't want to do. All right? You can't do that. You cannot make God do anything that is not according to his will. You can't do that. But you will need often to use your faith in order to lay hold of the promise God has made, in order to make that promise come to pass. You're not making God do what he doesn't want to do. You use your faith to lay hold of God's willingness, to lay hold of God's promise, to lay hold of God's availability to make a promise God has made come to pass in your life. Are we still here? Amen. Over and over, you read the scriptures, Jesus links miracles to specific acts of faith on the part of somebody. And when miracles didn't happen, he often would link it to unbelief. He would say the miracle didn't happen because nobody believed. Hmm? In the case of the disciples, one day Jesus was on the on the Mount of Transfiguration, and he had spent some time there with Peter, James, and John, and they had a glorious time. When they came down the mountain, Jesus met his disciples trying to heal a boy who was demonized, trying to cast out the devil out of him. But they couldn't. When Jesus arrived, the father turned to Jesus and asked Jesus to heal the boy. And we know that Jesus spoke, and the demons came out, and the boy was made whole. And then the disciples turned to Jesus and said, Lord, why couldn't we do it? So here's an instance of where, obviously, it was the will of God for this boy to be made whole. It was not a question of whether it was God's will, because if it was not God's will, Jesus would not have healed him and cast out the devil. So here's an instance where it is God's will for him to be healed. The disciples prayed, and he didn't get his miracle. When Jesus came and he prayed, he got his miracle. So the disciples said, Lord, how come we couldn't do it? And Jesus told them why. He said, the reason you couldn't do this is because of unbelief. So Jesus was linking the failure to receive a miracle to unbelief. Again, here's a clear instance where we have the power of God available, the will of God is to heal, the presence of God is there, but because of unbelief, the miracle didn't happen. Again, we're saying miracles are going to be available to you to fulfill God's will for your life. The power of God is going to be available to bring the promises of God to pass in your life and my life. That's not the question. God's presence and power is going to be available. But just because the presence of God is there or the power of God is there does not mean a miracle will happen. You and I will have to use our faith in order to connect with that power, in order to activate that power so that the Spirit of God can produce the miracles. Are you hearing me? So in 2016, I need to make sure that I'm not passive. I'm not just going about hoping and praying that there will be a miracle. No, I need to be able to accurately identify God's promise, God's will in a particular situation. And once I know God's promise and I know God's will, that I would be required to use my faith intentionally in order to take hold of grab hold of, lay hold of God's promise and God's willingness in order to make the miracle which God has promised come to pass in my life. All right, let me show you another instance of how important it is that you and I release our faith to receive miracles, not to qualify for miracles, but to take possession of what already is available to us in Christ Jesus. Are you hearing me? Again, hear, hear exactly what I'm saying. We're not, we're not making God do something. 
We're not forcing God to do something contrary to his will. What we're saying is God has already made promises. God has already made the power available. God has already given Jesus Christ to meet all our needs. So God's presence and power and willingness are already on our side there. But there's often going to be something that you and I have to do to release the faith to take hold of the promise and to bring that thing into manifestation in our lives. Don't just be passive going about your business in 2016, hoping and praying that maybe you will be, quote, unquote, one of the lucky ones that receive a miracle. Listen, I mean, Jesus was passing through. The miracle working power was there. There was a whole crowd of people that were present. I'm sure probably every one of them had, had need for a miracle. But they didn't receive it. Only one person received it, and it was the woman. Not the rest of them. Not because the power of God was not present, but because they were passive with their faith. They were passive in the presence of God. They were passive with the power of God. They were passive with the promises of God. They were just passive, and because they they were passive, nothing happened. But this woman, because she made up her mind she was going to receive her miracle, she took some active steps to grab hold of the power of God in Jesus for her healing. Amen. There's a scripture that says the violent taking the kingdom of God by force. Amen. We need to use our faith. God gave it to you to use it in order to lay hold. Listen, he gave me eyes to see, and when I use my eyes, I see. He gave me ears to hear. When I use my ears, I hear. He gave me a mouth to speak. When I use my mouth, I speak. He gave me faith to receive miracles. When I use my faith, I receive miracles. He gave me faith to make miracles happen. When I use my faith, I make miracles happen. But if I close my eyes, I will see nothing. If I close my mouth, I will say nothing. If I want to use the, the, to say something, I need to use the mouth he gave me. If I want to receive miracles, then I got to use faith for the reason for which he gave it to me. I got to release the faith I have, not just hold on to it. That was weak. Say amen. Amen. Hallelujah. So, I want to encourage and challenge you and myself. This year, miracles upon miracles upon miracles are going to be available to you, available to me, individually, and as a church. But I'm making up my mind. I'm not going to be passive with my faith in 2016. I'm going to identify God's promises, God's purpose, God's will, and I will actively, intentionally, on purpose, release my faith for certain miracles in my life. Let me show you another example of how the failure to release your faith can result in the failure of you receiving what you already qualify for and what is already given to you in Christ Jesus. All right? Let's look at Mark, uh, Matthew chapter 13. I want you to read from verse 54 to verse 58. Here's another instance where the presence of God, the power of God, the will of God was to heal, to deliver, to bless his people. And when we read the story, we'll see what happened. Beginning at verse 34, let's read that together. When he had come to his own country, he taught them in their synagogue so that they were astonished and said, where did this man get this wisdom and these mighty works? So when Jesus would come in, many times before he started to heal people, he would teach them because faith comes by what? Hearing. Faith comes by hearing. So he would take the word of God and begin to teach them, similar to what I'm doing today, to help them realize that miracles are for the day. To help them realize who he was and that the miracles they need were available in him for them. He would spend time opening the scriptures so they come to know who he is and what God wants to do. He did that here. But as he spoke, look at the next verse. Is this not, let's read, what did they say? Is this not the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary and his brothers James, Joseph, Simon, and just hold it there. Do you see what's happening? Jesus is teaching, but he's teaching in Nazareth, his hometown. This is where he grew up. And so he's teaching these folks who he is. He's wanting them to see that he is the Messiah, the anointed one, that God has anointed him with power to heal. And they're looking at him and saying, where did he come from? This boy, we know him. In other words, why is he trying to make himself somebody he isn't? He's just Joseph, and we know his father. His father was a carpenter. Since when did he become a prophet? 
Since when did he become this man of God he's trying to be? He's just a carpenter's son. We know his mother, a little Mary. We know where they live. Uh, his brothers, we know them. We know him. So why is he trying to, to act like he's better than us? So here's Jesus teaching, and that's the way they're responding to him. All right? And let's go to the next verse. And so we know his sisters also, and they are, they're, they're all here with us, right? Where did this man get all of these things? So you see, they're looking at Jesus, but they're not looking at him with any degree of respect. He's teaching them like he taught in other places, but they're not receiving. They're not hearing. They're not in agreement. They're resisting what he's saying because as far as they know, you're just a cop in the sun. Now look at the result of that. So they were... Instead of raising their hand and saying, hallelujah, miracles are in the atmosphere. Hallelujah, the Spirit of God is upon him, and he has been anointed to heal us, to deliver us, to meet our needs. God's will and power are present in this man to deliver us. Instead of responding that way, they got offended. Huh? They, in other words, who are you? You, you, you? you grew up here. Since when do, did you become a prophet? Why do you think you can tell us what to do? Come on, we know the Bible. We knew it before you. So they were offended that he, Jesus, was trying to teach them about God. And what was the result? Jesus said to them, let's read it aloud, a prophet is not without honor except in his own country and in his own house. The hardest people to help sometimes are the members of your family and your friends and the members of the church you pastor. Mm? I said, the hardest people to help sometimes are the people who attend the church you pastor. Why? Because they were so familiar with him, they didn't expect God to use him in any great way. After all, you're the cop in the sun. Hmm? Notice what happened. Now he did not do Everybody, let's read it together. Now, he did not do many mighty works there because of their... In other words, Jesus was there, and what did he want to do? Mighty works. And he wanted to do many mighty works. Open blind eyes, open deaf ears, make the lame to walk, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers. He was present, wanting to do mighty works, and many of them. But the Bible says at the end of the day, he couldn't do many. There's another scripture that says that all he did was heal a few sick people, and it was talking about minor illnesses, like a headache and these kinds of minor things. That was all Jesus could do. Hmm? That was all he could do. Why? Because of their unbelief. In other words, because they did not believe that this man was any person other than the carpenter's son. They did not take his words seriously. They did not believe really anything he was saying, and as a result, they limited the power of God, they limited the miracle working power of God to the point that nobody in his town got any miracles, real miracles done. Do you, do you see? It wasn't a question of God's will. It wasn't a question of whether the power was there. It was a question of whether they would believe it and release the power or not. Sadly, this time, they didn't. So here we are, we're about to go into 2016, and I have declared this year, our year of what? Our year of what? Our year of what? Now you have a choice. You can say, oh, that's just Bishop Johnson. We know him. Every Sunday he preaches. He's married to Pastor Chris. He puts on his pants just like we. He does everything like us. He's not special. So he's just come up with a clever slogan. You understand? You can respond that way like they did because they were so familiar with him because you are so familiar with me as your pastor. I can declare that, and I believe it's by the Spirit, but you can respond to it the way they did and nothing great will happen. Not because God doesn't stand ready to back that word, but because you don't stand ready to believe it. And the reason we believe it is because it's just our pastor. 
but let somebody come and say they're a prophet. Hmm? Amen. And because you don't know them, you're not very familiar with them, they can say the same thing. This is your year of miracles. And many of you will reach up and grab it. And you'll say, that's the word of the Lord for me. This is my year of miracles. The prophet had declared it. And you're going to grab it. You're going to release your faith in that word. And because, not because, not because he's more anointed than I. Not because the word he speaks is more from God than the word I speak. But because you have chosen to believe that the word he spoke came from God. You release your faith, and then you start having all these wonderful testimonies. And he said, well, when Bishop preached or said, we didn't get anything, but when this man said, <laughs> it wasn't because he was more anointed than me. It was because you didn't believe when I spoke. Yes, yes, sir. Yes. So I'm declaring over you now, this is your year of miracles. Yes. I'm declaring over you, this is your year of miracles. I'm declaring over you, this is your year of miracles. In Jesus' name. Amen. So you need to reach out with the faith you have, grab it, and make it your own. So that the God who calls me to speak it can perform it in your life. In the book of Hebrews, it is written, God made a promise in Hebrews chapter 4. He made a promise to Israel, but the Bible says very clearly, the word spoken did not profit them because it was not mixed with faith. When the word of God is spoken, when God makes a promise in his word or by his spirit to you, or God causes his servant to speak a word by his spirit, if you will lay hold of it and mix your faith and grab it, don't be passive and say, okay, we'll see. Okay, picture. Okay. I will sit, sit and see whether he's really a man of God. You will be sitting and sitting and sitting, and nothing will happen because you're doing nothing with that word. So I encourage you, if you need miracles and want to see miracles happening in your life this year, don't be passive. Amen. Reach out. Get the word that your bishop by the Spirit has spoken. Get those promises in the word and actively release your faith in what God has said. Do what this woman did. Don't let your miracle pass you by. Reach out and grab it by faith and make it come to pass. Turn and say, I'm going to make God's word come to pass this year in my life. I'm going to make God's promises come to pass this year in my life. Amen. Find out what God wants to do. Now, let me just give you a word of advice. Don't tell God how to do it. I think that's what we make the mistake. Take the promise, declare it, but let how God does it be up to God. Too often we want to not only claim it, but we want to tell him how we want it done. So don't tell him how to bless you financially. Just sow your seeds and declare your blessing and believe that the financial blessings that you have need of, let God use whatever means. You follow me? All right. So, because God is ready to do miracles, because we have proclaimed it by His Spirit, every time we gather together this year, let us believe that miracles are in the atmosphere, miracles are in the vicinity. Come to church expecting miracles. Don't just come to church and say, I'll hear a sermon and go home. Come to church, I'll hear a sermon, but even in that word, there will be power to heal. Even in that word, there will be power to deliver. Even in that word, there will be power for my breakthrough. Amen? Or while worshiping, I'm expecting the power of God to be manifested in worship and something to happen. Come expecting miracles when you come to church. When you go to your care groups, go to your care groups, and when you gather, expect Jesus to work miracles. When you pray this year, believe God will work miracles. Come on Friday nights to the well and expect God to work miracles. Are you listening to me? Let's have a miracle mentality throughout 2000 and amen. So do not allow your familiarity with me or your familiarity with this church 
to cause you not to take seriously what God wants to do here this year. Amen? Amen. Amen. But also, don't allow your familiarity with yourself to cause you to, be, to liberate what God cared and wants to do through you. Amen? Now, some of you, if I prayed for you, you got enough respect for me to believe that if I pray for you, God will hear. But you don't have enough confidence that when you pray for you, God will hear. I am preaching better than they're listening. Amen? Some of you do have enough respect for me to say, well, I'm going to have Bishop pray for me. And if Bishop prays for me, God will hear and God will answer. So Bishop, pray, pray for me. But while well, that's okay and that's good, the problem is many times you want me to pray for you because you don't have confidence that God will hear you when you pray. You're too familiar with yourself. They say concerning Jesus, he's a covenant son. You say, who am I? I know myself. I know I don't pray as hard as you pray. I know I don't pray as long as you pray. I know I'm not witnessing like I should. And I know I'm not tithing like I should. <laughs> Amen? So, so, so you look at yourself and you disqualify yourself as well because you're standing in your own righteousness. Ladies and gentlemen, we don't stand in our own righteousness. Whether, whether it's bishops praying or you praying, we all stand in the righteousness of another. What is his name? Jesus. What is his name? Jesus. What is his name? Jesus. Come and say, I am standing in the righteousness of another. Say hallelujah. So when I pray for you, I, I'm not standing in my own righteousness. If I stand in my own righteousness, then you're not going to get anything. I stand in the righteousness of Jesus when I pray in his name. And because I'm standing in the righteousness of Jesus, I have the right to expect when I pray, God will hear me. Amen. And you get to stand in the same righteousness. So when you pray, you stand in the righteousness of another. What is his name? Jesus. And so when you're praying in that name, it's as though Jesus himself is praying through you. So listen, don't allow the, the fact that you're so familiar with who you are and all your weaknesses to cause you to disqualify yourself. God will use you. The scripture says of Elijah that he was a man of like passions. In other words, Elijah was just like you. He wasn't better, different. He didn't have some things that you didn't have, don't have. He was just like you with all of the weaknesses that you have, he had. Elijah didn't qualify because he, he was different from you. The scripture says when, he, when, when Elijah prayed, God heard him. And the heavens closed up. There was no rain. When Elijah prayed again, the heavens opened up. Yet the Bible says, don't be impressed by Elijah. Because it wasn't that he was somebody different from you. Don't look at that and say, oh, what a mighty man of God Elijah is. No, look at it and say, oh, what a mighty God Elijah has. Come on, say hallelujah. Oh, what a mighty God, what a miracle-working God that Elijah has. Say hallelujah. And I've come to announce to you that Elijah's God is my God. Elijah's God is your God. Elijah's God is the God of Bethel. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. So I don't have to be special. I don't have to be different. You don't have, all you need is to pray to the same God Elijah prayed to. So here's my, here's my word to you. Can you pray? Can you stand in the righteousness of Jesus? Yes. Can you ask in his name? Yes. Then God can and God will use you. Are you hearing me? To work miracles. Amen. In your life and in the life of others. You will in Jesus' name. Look, the Bible didn't say in your own name, but you will lay hands on the sick in my name. When you stand in the righteousness of Jesus and you lay your hands upon the sick in Jesus' name, God will work miracles of healing through you. Amen? God will use you to cast out devils. God will use you because you will use the name of Jesus. And when you pray, standing in the righteousness of Jesus, it will be just as though Jesus himself is praying. God will hear your prayer. So do not disqualify me or yourself from being channels and conduits of God's power in 2016. Dare to believe that if God could use Elijah, then God can use you. Come on, say hallelujah. 
Say, I am a believer. I am a believer. I am not a doubter. I do not follow signs. Signs follow me. In the name of Jesus, I cast out devils. In the name of Jesus, I speak with new tongues. In the name of Jesus, if I drink any deadly thing, it will not harm me. In the name of Jesus, I will lay these hands upon the sick, and they shall recover in Jesus' name. Say hallelujah. So don't be afraid to lay your hands and pray. It's not about you. It's about Jesus' name. He said, Bishop, suppose I pray for one person to die, then pray for the next one. Amen. Your job is to lay your hands and pray. Let God do the work. But pray, release your faith in that name. Hallelujah. You don't know why he died. Lay hands still, because God is going to work through you. Thank God for Jesus. Amen. So now, let me, let me develop this further. I, I, I'm going to try to bring this to a close quickly. But listen to me. That night, or that day, when, when Jesus met Jairus, and Jairus prayed, there is nothing in the story where Jesus commends Jairus for his faith. There are other times where the Roman, the Roman centurion and others where Jesus said the person had great faith. But he doesn't commend Jairus for his faith. And when I read the story, I don't get the impression Josh, Jairus had a lot of faith when he was praying. His prayer seems to be that of a desperate person who has tried everything else. It hasn't worked. So let me try Jesus. Maybe he will come through. You know, you know people like that, right? They've tried everything else. It didn't work well. Okay. Nothing else has worked, so let me try Jesus and see maybe he can help. That's the kind of prayer he's praying. His daughter is dying, and he's tried everything else. Nothing else has worked. He said, you know what? Okay, let me try Jesus. I hear he can heal. Hopefully, he will hear, and he'll be able to do something. So his prayer was not really one of confidence. It was more hoping and praying, not believing and praying, but hoping. How many of you are familiar with those kinds of prayers? Because we all have prayed them. God, I, please help. And at this point, it's just a cry of desperation. And you, you're just hoping that somehow, because of his mercy, hopefully he will come through. We pray those kinds of prayers. Well, that's, that's, not, that's really not the way to receive a miracle, hoping and praying. Amen? When you pray, Jesus said, you ought to believe. You receive what you ask for. But we see in this situation, even though Jairus was just hoping and praying, it was a cry of desperation, Jesus still showed up at Jairus' house. His grace and mercy showed up. And Jairus' daughter was not only healed, Jairus' daughter was raised from the dead. Jesus literally raised Jairus' daughter from the dead. But what I want you to see here today, I'm convinced, Jesus did not raise her from the dead because of Jairus' faith. This miracle took place because of Jesus' faith. It was Jesus who believed God in this situation, not Jairus. Jairus benefited from the fact that Jesus was there and Jesus could intervene for him. And the truth is, thank God, there are times when we receive a miracle not because of our own faith. We receive a miracle because of somebody else's faith. Amen. Amen. Thank God that sometimes, even when your faith is weak, somebody who knows you somebody who's near you, somebody who's connected to you in some kind of way, they can pray, and because they have faith, God can work through their faith to give you a miracle. Because God wants to help you so much, he'll use whatever means is available to get his power to work in your life. Say hallelujah. So I thank God, I know that I have benefited from the prayers of others who have believed when I didn't believe. Amen? So listen to me. One of the things we can do for each other is to pray for one another. Amen? Amen? And sometimes our brother and sister is going through stuff, and sometimes when you're going through it, it's hard for you to believe. All right? But someone who's not experiencing it at the same level that you're experiencing it can pray, and they can have faith that God will intervene. And many times, God will use that person's faith to give you a miracle. All right? Those kinds of miracles do happen, but that's not the best. 
You don't want to be in a situation where ever you need a miracle, you got to depend upon somebody else. No, no, God wants you to have your own faith. You didn't hear me. God wants you to have your own faith so that when you need a miracle, you can receive your miracle on the basis of your faith in God. Amen? Or when you need to make a miracle happen because a miracle is passing you by or it's in your vicinity but it's not paying attention to you, so to speak, you need to have the kind of faith that can reach out and grab the miracle you need and make it happen. Okay. Say to your neighbor, you need your own faith. That's why Jesus said to his disciples, you have faith in God. Amen? Don't depend upon the faith of your pastor or depend upon the faith of your mother or your father or your wife or your children. God can work through them and God will use them, but listen, if you want to be in the position to, to receive miracles the way God wants you to receive, you need to develop your own faith in God. Have your own faith, like this woman with the issue of blood, so that when you need a miracle, even though nobody else even has you on their mind, because none of those people in that, in that crowd cared for her. Amen? As far as they were concerned, she was unclean. And they would, they would have, if they had known she was among them, she, they would have done something bad to her. All right? But she had her own faith. And she used it. Are you here today? Yeah. Amen. So, listen to me. In this year of miracles, make it your business to develop and to use the faith that God wants you to use so that you can receive miracles and take possession of it. All right? Now, let me, let me, let me, let me, let me, let me illustrate this again because I read, this is the point I'm trying to drive home this afternoon, that it's important that you use the faith you have. Miracles don't happen just because you're in the presence of God. Miracles can happen, but they don't just happen because you're in the presence of God. Miracles can happen, but they don't happen just because you are close to the power of God or the power of God is available. Miracles happen when, like this woman, you decide to use the faith God has given you to grab hold of the promise, to grab hold of Jesus, to grab hold of his word, to grab hold of his promise regarding that situation. Miracles happen when you choose to release your faith. Now, the proof of this in the text is that when the woman got healed, Jesus said, who touched me? And, 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 and the folks were saying, come on, Jesus. And the Sabbath, come on, Jesus. Why, why would you ask such a question? You're surrounded by all of these people. And everybody's touching you and you ask that kind of question. Which I thought was kind, kind of rude. But they asked it. Then Jesus said, listen, I'm not talking about who touched me physically. I'm talking about who touched me with a touch of faith. Because virtue, power, energy, resurrection life flow through me. And the scripture says instantly, when virtue went out of Jesus, instantly the issue of blood dried up. She was instantaneously healed by the power of God. We know that. Who heals her? Whose power? Yes, we all know it was Jesus and it was his power. But when Jesus turned around and the woman said, I'm the one who touched you, Jesus said, daughter, your faith, your faith, say your faith, your faith, say your faith. He said, your faith made you whole. So we give the credit to Jesus and he gave the credit to her. He gave the credit to her faith. He says, you're healed, you're whole, and it's because of your faith. Now, again, we know it was the power of Jesus that healed her. We know that. But Jesus is still crediting her for the miracle. And the reason Jesus is doing that, because he's saying, listen, even though the presence of God was here, the power of God was here, even though I was ready to heal you, if you had not released your faith, if you had not set your faith in motion to lay hold of that power and to lay hold of my willingness, if you had been passive with your faith, and if you had done nothing like the rest of these people, nothing would have happened. 
The fact that you made up your mind this day that you are going to release your faith, you are going to set your faith in motion, you're going to do something to release your faith for your miracle, the fact that you did that is the reason you're healed. Yes, it was my power, but it was your faith release that caused my power to flow into your body. Hallelujah. And so there will be many miracles that will happen, and we will give Jesus the glory. We will give Jesus the praise because it's going to be his power. But Jesus will credit that thing to your faith. He will say, yeah, I did it, but it wouldn't have happened if you had not released your faith. So, so, so you walk into a dark room, and it's, it's dark, and, and you, you go to the wall, and you flip the switch, and the light comes on. And the darkness leaves. Well, all of us know that the reason the light came on and the darkness left was because there's a power company, an electric company, Pepco, whatever you call it, that generated, produced, and supplied the power. If that company didn't exist, if it didn't generate the power and supply the power to that house, you could have flipped the switch all day, nothing would have happened. So we know it's the power company that is the source of the light. But we also know that the system is so designed that you have the authority and the ability to flip a switch that will cause the power to be active or dormant. So you are not the source of the power, but the system is designed so that you can do something to cause the power to be active and do something the cost of power to be dormant. It's up to you. Whether the power comes on and there's light, or the power stays on and you are in darkness. Huh? So if you flip the switch on and the light comes on, it will be accurate to credit you for light. We say, oh, thank you for putting the light on. Right? Because your simple and relatively insignificant or small action in flipping the switch, determine whether the light will come on or not, whether the power will be dormant or active. Amen. This is what is happening. Jesus said, I'm the source of power. I'm, I'm Pepco. Okay? Um, um, Allegheny. Whatever. I am producing. I am the source of the power to work miracles. But the way the system is designed is you have the authority, you have the ability to do something with your faith that will release the power and call, call, cause it to become active, that will cause my spirit to begin to work, or you can do something, the spirit will still be there, but dormant. Mm. So just like in the natural, you can flip the switch or cut off the switch, in the spirit realm, you and I have this God-given ability and responsibility, God respects us, the spirit of God is present in your life. Amen? But he gives you and me now the authority, the ability, the responsibility to determine whether the spirit will be active, working miracles, or dormant. Whether we will flip the switch of faith, turn our faith on, and allow the spirit to do what God wants to do by his power in us, for us, and through us, or whether we will turn off the switch of faith and have the spirit present, but not active. So we're told in scriptures, quench not the spirit. So you have the power to quench, to stop him from working. And if you have the power to quench the spirit, you have the power to set the spirit free. Yeah. Say hallelujah. Amen? You have the power to release the minister of the Holy Spirit so that he can do for you what God wants to do for you. He can fulfill the promises of God in your life. Amen? So let me say this to you in 2016. Don't let a day, not, don't spend one day in 2016 with the flip, with the switch of faith turn off. Amen. Keep the switch of faith turn on. Every day, make sure you flip the switch. Make sure that your faith is turned on. That's why you ought to begin every day in prayer. That's why you ought to get, begin every day in the Word. That's why you ought to begin every day meditating on the promise of God 
That's why you ought to begin every day speaking faith. Because you want to make sure that the switch of faith is on. So that whenever you need a miracle, the Spirit can work. Because you have released them with your faith to do whatever needs to be done for you, through you that day. Why is this Presbyterian church so quiet? Amen? Do you understand what I'm saying? Amen. With your faith, you can, you, 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 you're not turning God, God on and off. God is always on. But you're turning your faith on and off. The, 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 the Pepco always is providing the power. You're not cutting Pepco off or on. Pepco is always on. I mean, humanly speaking, you know, they, sometimes they got problems, but, <laughs> but usually, I mean, come on, I'm talking in the, under the perfect, perfect condition, they're on. You follow me? So you're not trying to turn on their generators. Their generators are on. They're producing power. So you're not turning God on and off with your faith. God is present. God is always on. But when you flip your switch, you allow that power that is already present to start working in you. Hmm? I'm teaching good. I'm, I'm teaching for my own benefit, if not for yours. Because in 2016, I intend to have the switch of faith in the on position. I intend to keep it in the on position because I want the Spirit of God to be working all the time in my life. Amen? In terms of my health, in terms of my finances, in terms of my family, in terms of the ministry. Amen. I want my faith, my faith is turned on in Jesus' name. Let's go to Ephesians 3.20. I want you to see something. Again, it's important that you have the switch of faith turn on. You're not turning God on and off. God's on. You're turning your faith on and off to allow the Spirit of God to work. Yes. All right? Let's read that, that, that passage together, verse 20. Now to him... All right, now to him who is able to do, God is able. Amen? That's not a question of God's ability. God can do anything that he wants to do. There's no limitation. Come on, this is the God that spoke the world into existence. This is the God that parted the Red Sea. This is the God that became a baby. This is the God that walked on waters. And so there's no question about his ability. Amen? Now to him who is able to do exceedingly, Abundantly above what? All that we ask or think. So God is able to do more than you ask him to do. But you still need to ask. Didn't say don't ask. The Bible says you have not because you ask not. God is able to do more than you're able to ask, but you still need to ask because that's how you're turning that switch of faith on. Above what you're able to think. Amen? You're turning your switch on. Amen? Listen, the way you think in your mind can place limitations on the miracle working power of God in your life. You can limit God with your thinking. You can limit the miraculous flow of God's spirit with your thinking. So part of turning that switch of faith on is prayer and your, the way you think. Let me use this woman as an example. There was a time in her life for 12 years when she thought the only way she could be healed was through doctors. She thought the only hope for ever recovering was for a doctor to give her medicine and, and through the medication she would get healed. All right? So if she was praying, she was praying that God would use the doctors. If she was praying. If she was not praying, she was just hoping that she will find a doctor to heal her. Maybe because up to that time, she had never seen anybody healed apart from doctors. Remember, Jesus just started the ministry, so for years, no miracles were actually happening. There was nobody there experiencing miracles. So she had been conditioned in her mind and her thinking to expect healing only through doctors and medicines. And if in her thinking, she thought the only way for her to be healed would be through doctors and medicine. That kind of thinking would have placed limitations on God's miracle working power in her life. 
I'm not saying you, don't, you can't use doctors and you shouldn't use doctors, but I'm just saying if the only way you think you can be healed is through a doctor, then perhaps the only kind of answers to prayer you're going to get for healing will be medical answers. If you think the only way God can heal you is through the doctors, then perhaps the only way you're going to be able to receive healing from God is through medicine. All right? So up to this time, the only way she thought she could be healed was through doctors and medicine. Unfortunately, no doctor could help her and no medicine could help her. And she got to the point where she realized, I've tried all the doctors, I've tried all the medicine, nothing has worked. And when, many times that's the best place to get to in order to receive a miracle. Because at that time now, you've tried everything. You've got nothing else to lose. So at this point now, she was willing to consider the possibility of being healed outside the medical box that she had placed healing within. And her thoughts concerning healing begin to evolve and begin to change. She started to hear, the scripture says she heard. She heard about Jesus. So she started to hear about this man who was healing people without medicine. She began to hear about this man who was healing people instantly by a supernatural power that bypassed the normal medical or natural healing paths that she always was familiar with. And the more she heard about Jesus healing people without medicine, without doctors, her thinking concerning how she could be healed began to evolve. And she began to realize, you know what? God can heal through medicine, but God can also heal without medicine. Just because I haven't gotten my healing through the medical thing doesn't mean I cannot be healed. So her thinking started to change. In her imagination, she began to see the possibility of her being healed miraculously, instantaneously, without the help of doctors. And as her thinking began to change, I can imagine, she started to imagine. In her mind, she started to see herself not being sick again the rest of her life, but she began to imagine herself being instantly and miraculously healed by the power of Jesus. Something began to happen in her mind that changed her expectation. And then she reinforced that with her mouth. She starts saying out of her mouth, I see myself, I see. If Jesus is healing people this way, then it's not true that I have to be healed through doctors. Thank God for doctors, but I can also be healed by a miracle. I can receive an instantaneous miracle. What the doctors have not been able to do, Jesus can do for me. He did it for her. He did it for her. You know what? I believe he's going to do it for me. And she began to see herself in her mind receiving an instantaneous miracle. And as she did that, she was removing the limitations in her mind concerning healing. That's important. Are you hearing me? That's important in, 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 in this thing as you want to, to, to turn your faith loose. Amen? You need to allow the Word of God to start to change the way you're thinking about what's possible. Don't put God in a box. Don't limit God just to natural means. I'm not saying God doesn't use that. I'm not saying don't receive that. But I'm saying listen to me. Let's expand our thinking in 2016. And let's believe, you know what? God can increase my income. It doesn't have to come through my job. You follow me? God can do some things. You see, because maybe all your life, the only way you paid your bills was through your job. And so you cannot imagine the possibility of God being able to supply you in any other way other than this job. Listen to me, don't quit your job, but expand your thinking and start believing, you know what, God? This is, you're not limited here. I, you're God of miracles. You can take five loaves and two fish. I can see you, God, using some other means, supernatural, outside of the normal way by which you supply my need. I can see myself receiving money unexpectedly. I can see myself getting a breakthrough unexpectedly. I can see you, you follow me? Change the way you think so you're not limiting God just to what is natural or normal. Say hallelujah. You, you, you move the scripture that was up there. He works exceedingly abundant above. All we ask and think, I'm not done. Okay? According to the, according to what? According to what? 
So God will work miracles above what you ask or think, but asking and thinking are important, but he can do even more than that. He will work miracles according to the power. What is the power? The power is the power of the Holy Spirit, right? The power of God. God can work miracles above what you ask or think according to the power of the Holy Spirit. Correct? Say yes. Yes. But then notice he says, according to the power that is working in you. Uh Aha. You see, for God to do more than you can ask or think, the power that is in you needs to be working. And I just told you whether the power is working or not depends upon what you do with your faith. Jesus said, according to your faith, be it done unto you. So what you do with your faith will determine whether the power that is in you will work or not. The power in you can be there in dormant if you flip the switch of faith off. Like all of these people in the crowd did. Their faith was off. The power, as far as they were concerned, was dormant. This woman said, "Uh -uh, I'm flipping the switch of faith on. And when she did that, the power that was present worked exceedingly abundantly above what she could even ask or think. So hear me, hear me. If you're a child of God, the power of God is present in you to work miracles. Amen? But I'm saying that you use your faith to make sure that that power that is in you is working and not dormant. Because if you allow the Spirit to work, if you allow the Spirit to move, if you allow the Spirit to move because your faith is turned on, He will exceed your expectations. Say hallelujah. I'm declaring over you that in 2016, God will do exceedingly, abundantly, above what you ask or think. Now, you need to ask and you need to think, but he's going to do more than that according to the power that you allow to work in you. And you will allow this power to work in you by the decision you make to flip the switch of faith on. Keep expecting. Keep believing. Do what the woman did. Release your faith in the power of God so that you can experience miracles. Amen. I don't have the time to develop this further, but listen to me. Faith is something you do. You release your faith by doing something. You have faith, but you release it by doing something. And by saying something, it is by saying something and doing something with the promises of God that releases the faith for that miracle. So don't be passive concerning God's promises and your needs. Understand the promise. Understand what the will of God is. And then turn the switch of faith on for a particular miracle with what you say this woman was saying, she was saying, she was saying, if I touch the hem of his garment, I will be healed. She was saying, she was healed, she was saying, she was saying. She was turning the, the switch of faith on with her words, but she didn't just speak. She did something to initiate the miracle. She said, if I touch the hem of his garment, I will be healed. And the miracle didn't begin until she did something. It was when she did something that the miracle was initiated and completed instantaneously. It was critical for her to say it and then do something in order to initiate it. The reason we don't see more miracles is because we pray and we pray and we wait. We never do something definite to release the faith towards that miracle. Let me repeat, Pastor John has given us this wonderful testimony. It bears repeating because we need to understand the significance of it. He has said that often when he is believing God for something, the way he releases his faith is to get a financial seed, whatever it is, but something that is meaningful and significant, and he names the seed based upon the promise he's claiming. So when he wanted a wife from God, he took a financial seed, named that seed according to that promise, and then released his faith by giving that. When he wanted a son, he did the same thing. He got a seed, named it a son, and then released his faith. He did something. He didn't just believe. He released his faith with the seed he sowed. And the minute he planted the seed, he was initiating a miracle. As far as he was concerned, at that point, God was working to bring it to pass. 
That's what, that's what it does. When you, when, you, when, you, when you do something, you initiate the miracle, and you fix it in your mind, the time and place the miracle started. Faith, I know it's something you do. So when you pray and when you believe, then find out. Sometimes God can tell you specifically what he wants you to do. If God tells you to do something, do it. If you don't get a particular direction, then decide on something that you know is meaningful and significant and do that thing. Release your faith at that time and fix it in your mind and heart. This is when my miracle was initiated. Sometimes a miracle happens instantly. It may take a while, but when you remember when you did it, you can always go back and say, that's when I received it. That's when God heard me. That's when it was initiated. My miracle is on the way. You see, but when you've done nothing, then you, you, your faith tends to be inactive. Are you hearing me? Hallelujah. So listen, we're going to experience all kinds of miracles in 2016. If you agree, say amen. amen. Say amen. amen. I'm going to experience mine, you're going to experience yours, and then we're going to experience it together as a church. But all of us in 2016 need to be speaking and declaring the things that we are believing for. Positively, and all of us in 2016 need to be releasing our faith by a definite act, something that we do that initiates the faith towards a particular promise in Jesus' name. And we will be surprised, pleasantly surprised, at how much God will do even over and above what we're asking for. In the Old Testament, in the Old Testament, God sent Moses to deliver Israel out of Egypt. And God gave him a rod. He said, Moses, take this rod. And whenever you need a miracle, when you need a miracle, when you need me to, to, to get involved supernaturally, to change the circumstances, take this rod and stretch it. And every time you stretch it, I will move by my spirit. Now, the power was not in the rod. It was God who parted the Red Sea. It was God who worked all those miracles in Egypt. But it was important for, Mary, for, for Joseph to do what? Stretch the rod. Because whenever he stretched the rod, he was initiating the miracle. He was releasing his faith. So the rod became a point of contact to release his faith. It was, it was the way he switched the, 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 he flipped the switch of faith on by stretching that rod. So whenever he had his rod stretched, he was believing God for a miracle, expecting God to move, initiating something. Every time he stretched that rod, he, he believed God was moving and God was working, and he was initiating the flow of God's power. So one day he's coming out of Egypt, and the, Israel, the, the uh, Egyptians are following him, and he finds himself trapped between the Egyptians behind him and the Red Sea before him. And Moses, Moses forgets that God has given him a rod and what God said. In that moment, he was afraid. Sometimes when we get fearful, we forget what God has said. All right? So he was so, under so much pressure and stress. He forgot what God had said. He probably started feeling sorry for himself. Look, 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 God, look where you brought me. Look at the situation I'm in. He forgot what God had told him, and he went to God and started to beg, oh, God, one of those desperate prayers. You see, God, you got to move. God, oh, God, if you don't move quick, if you don't come right now, we are in trouble because the Egyptians are behind us, the rest. God, why did you bring us out here to die? Right. So he's praying those kinds of desperate prayers, and God says, what, what are you praying to me? Haven't I already told you what I would do? Haven't I already made you a promise? Didn't I give you instructions? Why do you think I gave you that rod? Stop yelling, stop crying, and go ahead and take the rod and stretch it. Because when you stretch that rod, you will be releasing your faith in me, and that will initiate the miracle that, that you want from me. And so Moses got up, took the rod, and stretched the rod. And when he did that, he, he, he released his faith. And he initiated the flow. That's like Pastor John planting a seed or you doing something else that is definite in particular. But he did that and released the faith. And we know the story of the Red Sea opened up and they were miraculously delivered. Hear me. Moses' rod. That's why God gave the Moses a rod. And do you know what God has given you? The scripture says in Romans 12, 3, God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. Not a measure, but the measure. So if you are a Christian... You don't need faith. You can't produce faith on your own anyway. It's the faith of God. Paul said, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. The life which I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God. It's Jesus' faith. 
It was the rod of Moses, but then it became the rod of God. Your faith in Christ is not your own faith. It's the faith of God. Have the faith of God. Paul said, I'm living by the faith of Christ. Just like God gave Moses a rod, God had given every one of us the measure of faith. So we have what it takes to cause God's power to move. We have the faith that it takes to cause God to move mountains and cast them out of the sea, to heal our bodies and to work miracles through us. It's God's gift to us. For by grace you are saved through faith. Watch this. And not of, your, not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Faith itself is a gift from God. Amen? And so we have it like Moses was given a rod, you've been given the measure of faith. Now you have a choice. Will you cry and weep and holler like Moses, or will you take the rod of faith, and when you need a miracle, stretch it for them. Are you hearing me? Will you say, Lord, Lord, I'm holding up my faith. That's what I'm doing. I'm not going to be worried. I'm not going to be, I'm holding up my faith in this situation. The faith you gave me, I'm holding it up, and I'm declaring right now that your power is working in my life. I'm declaring right now this is my year of miracles. I'm declaring right now that by the stripes of Jesus I'm healed. I'm not going to die. I'm going to live. I'm recovering by your power. I'm declaring right now that I give and it's given unto me good measure, pressed down, shaking together. God, I'm declaring right now you are able to multiply the seeds that I'm sowing. I'm holding up the rod of faith, and I'm expecting all kinds of miracles to happen in my life. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Everybody in agreement say hallelujah. That is the word of the Lord for you. That is the word of the Lord for me. In Jesus' name. Come on, let's clap on the Lord. This is our year of miracles, and we're going to teach on miracles for a while. So next week, come, we're going to talk about miracles again, and we're going to keep developing it until, until, until we're doing what we need to do in order to facilitate the flow of miracles God has already prepared for us. In Jesus' name. I, I didn't emphasize it tonight, today, but we, we need to. Listen to me. Your words are very, very, very critical. She kept saying, she kept saying, if you're going to release your faith, you've got to begin with the words you speak. The Bible says we believe, therefore we speak. You cannot experience God's miracles if you're, not, if you're speaking doubt and unbelief. Open your mouth and speak God's word and God's promises. Speak them positively, speak them confidently. In the face of everything contradiction, contra contradictory, Speak it. That's, that's where you start. All right? We will continue. We'll build on this next week, so make sure you're here.